lot to do. Let's let's cover it off. I want to give plenty of time for questions, as Adrian has said. So welcome to this Elephants Don't Forget webinar, where we discuss with subject matter experts, Adrian, and leading authorities, Adrian, the <laughs> key issues that are impacting and affecting financially regulated firms. I'm Philip Allen, delighted to welcome you on this 60-minute webinar discussion on tick box compliance. Is your approach to compliance perhaps damaging your culture? Um, big call, Adrian, um, already, even by the title. Um, but I want to start off by posing a couple of questions there. And, you know, what well, we're trying to be controversial, but also we just want to give you some food for thought um, throughout this webinar. Question, have you ever thought that your approach to compliance might inadvertently be scuffing the culture you'd like to build? Have you ever considered if your tick box approach to compliance training is putting your organization at risk? Or have you ever wondered why your compliance program perhaps lacks that executive support or stakeholder buy-in. If you pondered these questions or considered those questions, um, you're in good company because whilst we don't have a dream team of panelists um, um, to answer every single question on culture, conduct, and such like, we've got lots of webinars in the future plan as well as webinars in our library and our resource section to do that. What we want to do um, today, Adrian and myself, is give you the live MTV unplugged version of our views on a number of these issues. Adrian, you've got a very short summary that you're going to whiz through that will help people through what we're going to discuss. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Philip. Hello, everyone. I, look, from my point of view, I, I think times are changing and I think our regulator in the FCA is, is getting ever more sophisticated and importantly more able to police and enforce at scale so they can do more with less. I think the consumer duty is a game changer um, and I think it's going to force firms to change their culture. Uh, in, in my belief your people are the epicenter of your culture. And if you want to achieve a genuinely customer-centric culture, you need to empower your people, but you need them to be competent in role before you empower them. Um, to the contentious question that Philip posed, uh, in my belief, I think the current industry default approach to training and competency, commonly referred to sort of tick box compliance, doesn't work and it will not deliver the in-role competence that you need. Um, there is a much better, affordable and more easily deployed approach um, that we will talk about uh, 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 towards the end of this uh, session. And what we've done um, there, just want to unpack those in a bit more detail, what Adrian has just said. And here you see on the screen a number of the bullet points that we'll be covering off. We may jump, um, and we don't make any apologies for this, by the way, we did jump around some certain <laughs> issues here um, and the reason being is that we've got some fantastic feedback from yourselves over the last um, year or two years and this is what you've told us that keeps you up at night and also what are the challenges that are facing firms in 2022 especially those firms who are preparing for consumer duty which is obviously the first regulatory deadline on the 31st of October um, Firstly, I'd like to say thank you to all those people who participated in our polls and, and voted in the questions that we've posed. Without your impact, certainly this wouldn't be possible. Lots of things I bet keep you up at night, Adrian, but you know, this is what webinar users have told us over the last two years, keep them up at night. What are your thoughts when you see these poll results then? Thanks for that, Philip. Um... <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we look at, if, if we look at the, 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 the date on the slides, this, this to me, speaks to a sector that is, in my opinion, generally out of step with the expectations of the regulator. Um, it's, it's not criticism per se, but rather just a, a shout out of what the data is telling me. I see a regulator who's upping their game and um, increasing, and to be honest, a, a number of brands in the sector are already responding and changing the way they do things. But to use your phrase, Philip, I think many are, are living in a parallel universe. If 66% of our of, of our poll respondents say they're challenged to monitor and evaluate uh, their approach to monitoring and treating customers fairly, I think they're going to have a real challenge mm. as consumer duty starts to bite. Mm. 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 And, and for me, the standout stat on this page 
um, and these are um, three of, of the six that we've we've got posted, is you know, a real challenge around culture, a real challenge that, you know, and I'm very grateful that firms have been candid in this, 50%, 15% admitting that their approach to culture is a tick box rather than a value added. Look, you know, what, what I know is the regulators using artificial intelligence and an increasingly sophisticated tech stack to monitor firms from afar and far more efficiently. And I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that that monitoring won't relate to checking boxes being ticked. I think that monitoring will be of your customers direct and monitoring and measuring the customer experience that your brands are delivering to the marketplace. So when I see that like 66% or whatever the number was, a man is not confident demonstrating consistent approach to training uh, in treating customers fairly, I've sort of got to believe the industry is trailing way behind an increasingly sophisticated regulator. Um, the key point, I'm, you know, what the, the blow I want to land here is in the last 18 months, what I've seen is a regulator adopt powerful technology that changes their ability to monitor and police. It amplifies it enormously. Mm. And yeah, I just want to pick up on that point because the trajectory of the FCA is therefore to see um, the regulator announced, and I'll post this in the chat later on so you can have a reference point to this, that in the pandemic, they were um, overt that they were using digital listening tools to monitor consumer difficulties in the insurance market and taking legal action against such insurers to ensure customers and businesses could claim on their business interruption policies. So this is not just, you know, a theoretical discussion. This is actually what the regulator is saying, hey, we're a data-led, data-driven regulator now, and we're using such tools as this. Um, Adrian, you have a very strong view on this, that, you know, for some firms, they are playing catch-up, aren't they? I, I, I'm absolutely certain. So look, I, I think the consumer duty point is, the regulator, and I'll, I'll keep referring to this phrase like a bit of a stuck record, the, the, the regulator's talking about its expectation for firms to be customer-centric, not profit-centric. Mm. 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 And then when you add layer that on the fact that now um, the FCA, to my surprise, actually, I, I didn't realise this until we were doing some research on this webinar, now scanning an average of 100,000 websites for financial scams every single day shows us that this promise to be a data-driven regulator is more than just words. And you think it comes down to one single thing, then? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it, 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 it does come down to, for, for me, the regulator's ability to operate now at, at, at at scale, but I wanted to spend a bit of time for it just just on this point about profit because I I think that um, there's I, th I don't think the regulator is saying by saying I want you to have a customer centric culture is saying you can't be profitable. In fact, uh, uh, from comments that I've seen, the regulator fully expect firms to be profitable and and wants that if we're to maintain our status as a global financial services powerhouse. Mm. I just think that um, profit made at the expense of fair customer outcomes is the regulator's beef. So I think uh, many firms in the market today are profit centric. And I think that over the next X months and years, all of the firms are going to go through varying degrees of transition to a more or completely customer centric culture. Okay, big calls in that, Adrian, uh, there. But clearly, the introduction of consumer duty would suggest that that is exactly what the regulator wants um, um, because they do feel that customers are not delivering good customer outcomes that you talk about um, in that no, setting. 
that you're they're, they're not for it they're, they're, they're just they're simply not or they or, or they wouldn't have done what they've done right but um you know I, i'm i'm a massive apple fan right so uh, the, the brand apple um uh, if you look at that brand they everything they do is driven by their customer they they live and breathe customer centricity and and they're perhaps one of the largest firms in the world and one of the most profitable um customer centricity permeates that 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 brand and it's a bit of a throw away, throw away line but I, I i can't imagine they have any sort of tick box policy anywhere in that business mm, mm. um they <laughs> they 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 don't and and their relentless focus is on customer value and and certainly not money i i, I pulled this stat off by or this quote off by tim cook ceo of apple and he says the following he says there's this thing in technology, almost a disease, where the definition of success is making the most um, out of how many clicks do you get? How many active users do you have? How many units do you sell? Everybody, he says, in technology seems to want big numbers. Steve Jobs never got carried away with that. His focus was making the best products. And I think that lays a marker down, doesn't it? That... The, the regulator is far less interested in ticking boxes and far more interested in, as you say, the customer centric culture and therefore evidencing that through correct training communications. That can be evidence at every step of the customer journey, and it's difficult to see how firms under consumer duty can take. And I, I don't doubt that I think the money advice trust actually picked out how many times this was said in the consumer duty um, um, CP to avoid causing foreseeable harm to customers if your approach is a tick box approach to compliance. Indeed. Um, listen, I would go a bit further and suggest that in future, if as a brand you're offering up uh, your annual refresher training results, uh, I dare say where everybody passed, probably with an inconceivably high mark and perhaps nobody actually failed, if you're offering that up as your evidence that your employees are competent in role, I would suggest that's akin to waving a red bag at an angry bull. Because it, in, in my opinion, it just shrieks, missed the point. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, well, here, here's a challenge. Let's ask the audience if they agree or disagree. Um, um, with um, us um, on there. So you'll see on the screen, hopefully you'll see on the screen, um, to what extent does your firm have a customer-centered culture on a scale of one to 10? One being it's got a profit-centered culture on the far right-hand side, you've got a customer-centric culture. There's no judgment here. We're not showing the, um, the results um, and naming shaming organizations. It's an anonymous poll, which would be delighted if you would partake in that'd be fantastic for us and also it would give uh, an understanding of whether um what we're saying yeah really resonates um with with yourself there and um, adrian you you definitely got a view from your own previous experiences um of organizations yeah. that you've led um where yeah. the balance is yes um i'm, I'm smiling because i am going to say what we said i really shouldn't say but um <laughs> i i, I I think there's 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 three people in this relationship, Philip. Ooh, I think okay. there's there's the firm, and we're seeing the firm <laughs> voting on themselves. This is what we think our culture is. There's the regulator and there's the customer, and I'm not entirely sure to what extent the regulator cares what your view of your culture is, because I think the regulator's just going to ask your customer. And looking at the screen. I wonder how many customers would vote that way. Mm. Just saying. Anyway, so I, you know, I, 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 for my sins, you used to run a, a business called British Gas that's owned, owned by Centrica, and, and we talk about firms having a profit-centric culture or a customer-centric culture. Um, if you look at that business, and I'm sure people would say. Yes, we've got a we've got a customer centric culture in Centrica. And if you look at the facts, that business made one point two billion pounds in the first six months of this year. 
which is a five fold increase on the same period last year, largely driven by the removal of the energy price cap and the dramatic rise in consumer fuel bills. So I suspect, and it's just an analogy, it's just a, it's not from this industry, so I, 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 it's certainly that you know, I, I can talk about my time there. I look at that and say, that looks to me like, irrespective of what people in that brand may think their culture is, as a consumer, I look at that and say, that's a one. That is an entirely profit-centric business. Mm. Mm. And um, clearly, if, if again, if we were doing a customer sentiment analysis, then that might be slightly different um, viewpoint to what perhaps Centrica or British Gas would actually consider themselves um, there. Correct. There's, a, there's that parallel universe. Um, well, I think that certainly the regulator um, is taking a different approach, aren't they? They're using the single view analytic tools um, to provide this, what they call a one-stop shop of key data and indicators determine, um, to determine where they should intervene. And that level of sophistication using AI, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera, um, has never been seen before by the regulator. And, and, and in truth, should give firms something to think about, don't you think, um, when perhaps products or services don't meet consumer expectations. And just to make sure that you know, we are absolutely echoing what the regulator is saying. I want to post in the chat where you can actually refer in further detail to that. But regulate, um, but Adrian, there's a mood shift, isn't there? And do you, do you sense that in the marketplace that the regulator is just expecting much, much more from organisations? Yeah, I agree. Philip, can I ask you to take the poll off the, off, off the screen, please? I think yeah, it's, it's done. I, yeah. Think, um, I don't know if everyone's seeing it as, as, as the same. Yeah, I, I do. And I think, you know, I'm not a, a cultural change expert and, and I'm sure there's, there's there's plenty of models out there for cultural change. And, you know, you can talk to firms like EY, PwC and, and, and Hogan Lovells, et cetera, and they'll, and they'll show you some marvellous models for achieving that transition. But I think from my personal perspective, I think that uh, cultural shift comes about when the folks that run the business decide it's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. So the first thing that's got to happen is the exec. It has to come from the top. The exec decides we're going to change the culture of this business. And then they have to consistently and continually walk that talk. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So why are firms, are, sorry, I should say, are firms getting the culture wrong? If so, why? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't necessarily think it's intentional, but I, I speak to a lot of firms every week. And, you know, one of the consistent themes that I'm hearing of late is that my, my, my phraseology, right? So, um, unless we quote me, but the, the SLT don't get it. So a senior leadership team, yeah, but they don't get it. They're, they're looking at consumer duty and treating it like it was, what was your phrase, Philip? Uh, <laughs> TCF on speed or something? Yeah. Um, they're, 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 they're treating it really as, a, as, a, as an exercise to go through, much akin to SMCR, mm. if, if I'm honest. And, and, and they're just, they're not on board. And if you want to change the culture of business and you haven't got the exec on board, you're going to change the culture of the business. Mm. Mm. I think that the, the, the focus and, and no doubt that heads of compliance, compliance officers, risk officers and others on this would know this. But there is a huge difference between what was expected under TCF, where the regulator would say, you know what, um, is your TCF framework robust and appropriate? And the consumer duty, the FCA is asking, are you actually delivering good customer outcomes, not fair customer outcomes? And you can't explain that away, can you? You can't say, right. you know, um, OK we are trying um it's either we are doing it and we've got the evidence to prove that or not yeah, yeah listen so one of the things i'm going to be talking about is the importance your people play in any sort of cultural transformation um it is relatively easy for an exec to sit down in the boardroom and decide you're going to shift your culture 
yeah and then decide that they're going to right we're going to live this and make it happen if the humbling lesson i've learned in the past is that if 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 you haven't won over the hearts and minds of your people yeah you can steer the wheel as much as you want you can press as many buttons and pull as many levers as you want the ship will continue sailing in the previous direction until such time as you have won over the hearts and minds of all of your people and got them aligned with that strategy so i think the component part that relates to the exec is dare I say, relatively easy, even though I'm hearing that a lot of, a goodly number of firms don't believe their execs on board. I think by far the harder task is the people. Mm -hmm. And to change those mindsets in the people um, requires you know, new capabilities and those new capabilities have to be learnt. So training is going to be critical in embedding that organisational culture that firms seek indeed completely i completely agree the, the your training model is going to have to change we'll talk about it in a bit more detail um because the biggest challenge i think that firms are going to face in this journey is harnessing what i call the goodwill and discretionary effort of the first line of defense mm -hmm. And um, in the new world, under the new um, consumer duty, April 2023, um, um, so July 2023, um, you know, organisations are really going to have to review and update and improve governance arrangements. Boards will need to start asking some tough questions about themselves and also about their organisation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like the phrase, is the culture built in or is it bolted on and to make my point it might be quite interesting to see what the consumer reaction would be to Centrica's belief that they are a customer centric organization or whether or not they are in fact a profit centric organization with a veneer of customer centricity what, what do you mean by that then what? well you know I, I just just compare apple's approach with what I'm seeing in the market in the, it, it, with, with, for example, Centrica, um, it's starkly different. Apple lives it and believes it. You've only got to walk into an Apple store. Yeah. My local ones in Kingston in the Bentel Centre. You walk in, you're almost assaulted by a, 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 a brand advocate who's so highly trained and competent and capable. It's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> and you compare that with the, same sentiment that you might uh, receive as a customer of one of Centrica's companies, and it's markedly different. Mm, mm. Profit earned at the expense of the customer. Yeah, and I think that yeah, you're justified in what you say there because you know they have a I think in in America and the US sorry in, in Europe eighty seven percent brand loyalty. I mean it's it's yeah. it's it's absolutely fantastic, um, and they're yeah. expensive, Philip. Mm. No one's going to say, I bought an Apple product and it was cheap. They might say it's value for money, yeah? But I think generally speaking, people say it's a lot of money, but it's worth it. And so when we talk about this built-in culture, what we're talking about here is the mission, vision, and values, and that you know, permeates through the organisation, um, and that in its turn leads to decisions more effective and decisions and transparent decisions about strategy, planning, and hiring, and an honesty within the firm to talk about those conduct issues around vulnerability, financial crime and complaints. Um, and, you know, I think that what you're talking about here in the, within the built-in culture is an organization not afraid to put the mirror up to themselves, are they? Uh, and looking at those gaps, looking at key learns, looking at rooms for improvements always and there because of the tone from the top, not the, perme not the permafrost in the middle, um, but something that cascades through the whole organization to the front line, regardless of department, team, or function there. Is, is, that, is that fair? I, 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 I agree. And I would also call out the extent to which Apple invest in their, the competence of their people. It is continual, yeah? They thrive because all of their people are advocates for their product. Mm. 
And if you just believe that um, or thought that Adrian was a lone voice in, in looking at um, culture in that way, the FC have for many years now, Adrian, um, laid down their approach to the issue. And we've just looked at one of the quotes here. But I would also point to you, I've just posted it in the chat, the recent Dear CEO letter um, that was posted out to 3,500 lenders highlighting their expectation. And, you know, you'll see in this, um, not necessarily for this webinar now for you to view, but, you know, they, they quote, not investing enough. This is what they say about firms to ensure that they have well-trained staff capable of having complex conversations with customers in financial difficulty and are able to tailor forbearance to customers' individual circumstances. Uh, you know, that's, that's pretty yes. outstanding, isn't it? It is. You know, just being a bit cynical, but, I, you know, I, I'm just reflecting some of the things that I hear in my daily work life around uh, feedback from people in financial services firms, some of whom are waiting. They're waiting in my words, to see what happens. They're waiting to see perhaps if the regulator does come knocking and say, your culture doesn't look to be fit for purpose. Look at all this evidence that we've got, yeah, that would indicate such. And I, you know, my, I guess my experience of transforming the culture of business, a big business, it takes a lot of time, even downhill, wind behind you, best tech stack, everything on your side. It takes a lot of time. And I just wonder if, if you're one of those brands sitting there thinking, mm, I'm not sure consumer duty really is going to cut it. Um, it's SMCR Mark II. We can sit and wait. I would just say, I think it's going to be a much more uncomfortable journey under increased scrutiny to attempt to transition your culture than if you chose to do it without the scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, you've always said it, um, Adrian, that you can't necessarily show empathy with a script and <laughs> that healthy customer-centric cultures are not afraid of evidencing what they're good at and what needs improving. Yeah. Mm. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that most on this webinar are already embarked in some way shape or form or, or on a cultural transformation at least to a point where they're making the customer uh, more centric yeah or customer centric with profits sort of culture as i as i call it um i think that the challenge that you all face because you told me so in various polls that we've done in webinars over the last 18 months is how do you measure it um, and I say that from, from first-hand experience because in big businesses that I've run, I've had plenty of management information and, uh, and data related to all sorts of aspects of the business. The area that we struggled most with was our people. Mm. Okay. In, in, in so much as evidencing authentic, genuinely identifying people competence eluded us mm. okay um but that won't cut the mustard when you have to under consumer duty you have to evaluate how your staff are supporting customers through their financial journeys and enabling them in real time to make decisions in their best interest and to pursue their financial objectives um that means role-specific training that achieves better customer outcomes. Yep, it does. And I think that, you know, again, I speak to lots of people every month. I think that thinking you can systemize and script those customer interactions to take out the need to train up those individuals. Um, I think that journey, uh, that path's been walked before by brands and it's littered with the corpses of brands that have failed. We've all been on the receiving <laughs> end of, well, it is, isn't it? You know, we've all been on the receiving end of appalling 
clunky customer service where you know that the individual is either following a script or just going through a systemized process and it's insulting it's dreadful um so quite apart from the uh, appalling customer outcome it's also a soul destroying job to do and 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 with the market right now i think that's a where i think a lot of firms are struggling to get talent into the business i think that's something that firms need to need need to think about okay so how, how do you know that well how have you come to that conclusion or um about about knowing and understanding perhaps what hasn't worked in the past you know, is not working for firms now well i mean that to be honest philip you need i think if you if you just googled customer service uh, that that scripted customer service you'll find and the, the market's moved away from that in fact i think you'd find that a lot of brands who have potentially looked to offshoring customer contact have brought that customer contact back onshore or have got more intelligent uh, hybrid sort of onshore offshore type models mm. uh, i just i just think that, that service yeah whilst technology can take out some of the mind numbingly boring stuff like let me give you a meter reading for example yeah it it doesn't replace that what was the phrase that the fca used complicated conversation or something along those lines sophisticated mm -hmm. conversation yeah yeah um and and you're right because i think that what um nelly um webinar listeners and and watchers are telling us and the feedback from the regulator there is a disconnect isn't it and so certainly from these stats um from firms firms still have a long way to go in their approach to tnc yeah I, look case in point about my earlier comments that um Many firms don't think they're ready for consumer duty um, or indeed <laughs> ready for an increasingly tech savvy regulator that, mm. you know, through the use of AI and, and other such tools can, can can monitor and act at a far greater scale than ever before. And I think that one of the one of the game changing factors about that is that the regulator doesn't even need to come and ask you. Yes, so I, so I understand it. The regulator yeah. will be gathering the data themselves, yeah, and presenting that data to you as evidence of your failure. <laughs> and I guess my question, I mean, it's harsh and blunt, isn't it? But you know, let's not let's not duck the issue. So, if the regulator is going to use this proven technology to gather large amounts of customer feedback about your brand. What are you going to use to defend yourself when they turn up? Because I don't suspect they'll turn up asking you, what do you think the culture is like in your business? I suspect they'll turn up telling you that your culture is broken. Yeah, um, you're right, Adrian, because it's worth reminding you know, webinar attendees that the FCA um, last year produced some, some guidance, which I'm, I'm sure that organisations on this webinar would have, um, would have actually um, probably reviewed themselves. But it's worth worth actually putting in um, FG21, um, where they pull no punches. And I was really surprised um, by this, where they were in their assessment of firms' approach to treating vulnerable customers. And I've just posted that in the chat that they outed senior leaders and they said, look, um, they don't have the sufficient oversight providing the direction that is expected on the approach to vulnerability and vulnerable customers. They don't have the MI sufficiently well developed to feed into supporting governance processes around vulnerability and um, going back to your point they have limited evidence and i quote of mi from firms that demonstrate whether vulnerable training to staff is working the fca's adrian is not holding back on this and you you basically think that there is a there's a seismic shift between what the fca were um, advocating under SMCR and potentially yeah. the consequences and the impact of consumer duty. Why, why do you think that? Well, look, I think these are my personal opinions. So I think SMCR was, you know, a bit, bit, bit of a wet blanket, to be honest. I, from what I understand, there's only one individual being prosecuted under that legislation, which seems out of shape with reality. Um, I think one of the reasons SMCR was a wet blanket was because it's 
very insular looking legislation. Yeah, uh, it's quite dull and insular looking and to use the word, not very newsworthy. Um, consumer duty, on the other hand, is super newsworthy, um, which trust me, having run British Gas, yeah, you will then end up with something called trial by the Daily Mail, our trial by the Sun, where you are guilty, full stop, and you are plastered, where I suspect no brand wants to be, but consumer duty will, you know, the, the, the papers will jump on the bandwagon, right? You don't want to be, the last place you want to be is splashed over the tabloids with the media quoting ex-members of your staff talking about the profits and bonus first culture in your business. Um, particularly when you have very little credible evidence to substantiate that your culture is different. Mm, mm, mm. So, look, we've discussed a lot um, in, in this webinar already. Um, let's recap on some of the issues and the key points uh, raised so far. Yeah, OK, that's helpful. So the regulators up their game um, and has just got much further reach and greater capability to go and find for themselves the evidence that they need to prove what gen authentic, what culture your business has got. I think our historic polls have shown that compliance professionals and senior managers are, my word, nervous. Um, I think a lot of firms will be transitioning from, you know, to be polite as possible, tr transitioning from a more profit-centric culture to a more customer-centric culture, and will, to varying degrees, be struggling with that. I, I think bolting on or attempting to bolt on customer-centric culture is just a, a waste of time. Um, on the other hand, I know that empowering your people does work and is a critical success factor, but I also know that in order for you to empower your people, your people need to know what they're doing. And evidence from hundreds of millions of interventions in our world proves that on average, your employees know about half of what you need them to know in role. Mm -hmm. So it's not an overnight thing. I think leadership is all, it's relatively easy for leadership to do their thing. I think it's much harder to uh, transition the people and uh, get them on board mm. and as we've said on this slide uh, culture is more than just having the right policies processes and procedures in place right yeah I, I think so so I mean I look at consumer duty ignoring the sort of milestone the filing milestones and things like that I, I look at it as two components there's there's the sort of the products and processes point of view that we covered with experts like Hogan Lovells and that, that, that very very interesting but we I think we've done that and there are experts out there who can help firms with that. Uh, the second component part of consumer duty for me is culture and your people. And I, I actually think that's much harder. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it's just me um, um, uh, mouthing off here, um, but <laughs> I don't think you, you can transition to a customer centric culture without data. And the reason why I say that firms do you know, some firms don't even collect sufficient amounts of customer and data. Or if they do, do they really honestly have an accurate view of perhaps what's contained in it, let alone the data on how their staff are supporting their customers? But that, I guess, might make for a comfortable situation when asked to hand it over to the regulator to evidence the customer support um, or the training to support good customer outcomes. So, in short, what's the difference that makes a difference, in your opinion? Um, there, you've listed um, a, a few brands that um, Nelly's working with at the moment. But what what is the difference that's making the difference towards attitudes, behaviours, and beliefs of individual staff members, and therefore permeating through to, to this culture that you talk about? Yeah, I mean, there's some bullets on the. You know, I'm like bringing a slide everyone can read. I think. Um, for me, it's about the need to focus on the role your people will play in creating and maintaining an authentic customer 
centric with profits culture. So for me, the, the, you know, if, if I land one punch in this webinar, it's your people will determine the culture of your business, whether you like it or not. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, what's the trigger for these firms to adopt Nelly and to use yeah. AI power? Um, they, 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 these are these are serious tier one brands, right? They 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 they, they recognise. I think a lot of people. I speak to a lot of people who recognise that that you know the the sort of the industry default approach to people competence doesn't work. Mm. It just doesn't work because it doesn't deliver in role competent employees. And all of our customers have come to that conclusion and and and, and recognise it and now do something different. Mm. In fact, we get a new brand every week this year joined our customer herd and that will double next year so we'll have two brands a week joining our customer herd because the current model just it, it, well to be blunt the current model which we call single point in time training and competency it it is broken mm. um, and I, I obviously i've got an opinion but you know like i said i speak to a lot of people every month and you tell us broadly this is how you tackle employee training and competence and and we we tell you that this delivers employees who are 54 percent competent in role as defined by that firm's individual standards so we're not applying a, a generic template you're saying customers are saying we expect this individual to have this level of competence and we are evidencing that on average they've got 54 percent of that level of competence yeah. um so i th i I think one of the problems with the approach is it's theoretical. It's very theoretical. And I know there'll be some L and D practitioners perhaps on the call saying, well, no, no, we, we, we do we do it, we do it differently. But you know, just just hit, hit me out for a second. Um, you know, my favorite analogy is I like to ride my bicycle. So my favorite analogy is riding a bicycle. If you've never ridden a bicycle before, you could uh, take a CBT course on bicycle riding. You could take the little short-term memory test at the end and fail and take it again and fail and take it again and then pass. And you could again get a certificate to say, yep, you are a competent bike rider. Then you go outside and you pick up the bicycle for the first time, you fall off. That's because riding a bicycle is a learned competence, not a pub quiz. And delivering against your customer's expectations is a learned competence, not a pub quiz. Hmm. Hey, I, I don't diss my cycling proficiency. Um, <laughs> okay, I haven't won the Tour de France yet, but you know, there's still time. There's still time. Yeah, right. <laughs> look, as look as a head of learning myself, I can't see how you can keep employers up to speed um, with, with the newest regulation and equipment to provide the best customer service possible with a one-time assessment. You know that no. I believe that ship has sailed, um, uh, and and I guess that this is what you know, firms are giving you feedback on is that they just can't keep yeah. doing what they've already done. This, this is, these are customers' words. These aren't, this, this aren't, aren't, aren't my words, right? So these are your peers saying this. And, I, and you know, if, if I had a quid for every time somebody says that the current approach to compliance training doesn't work, I'd probably be sitting on a beach having a beer rather than doing this, this webinar. So, um, look, so in, in, in my opinion, it's just... It, the single point in time training is it's not fit for purpose. It doesn't deliver competent staff, which was the original FCA requirement. It did, however, deliver a tick in the box. Um, but in my opinion, at an increasingly high cost. And uh, I, I think the most compelling reason is in this final box. You, you, our customers and the market tell us that your employees know this doesn't work. They know this approach doesn't work and, and they see it as a chore, something that needs to be completed before they can get back on with their work. Um, you know, I, I frequently hear leaders and managers say, oh, yeah, you know, sort of shrug and say, they don't remember half of the training that, 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 that they've just been on just a few days before. And, and you know, joking aside, the evidence from literally hundreds of millions of interventions would prove them right. Mm. So what's the solution there, um, Adrian? Obviously, you've been dealing with these companies for a number of years now. They've given you feedback on what their challenges is, um, um, are and perhaps the, the cultural challenges that they want to um, shift from and move towards then. 
what's um, what's continual assessment and how will that actually impact um, those firms that you're working with? Yeah, uh, okay. I, I, I'm not going to bore the pants off everybody with a with a with a a, a, a sales pitch. What 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 I, what I will say is that we, we know that competent empowered employees are critical to achieving uh, your goal of authentic sort of customer and profit centric culture and we know that the let's call it the market default approach to training and competency is uh, not delivering the level of competence and in fact is potentially my phrase poisoning the well in so much as they in, in so much as it it causes compliance cynicism with your workforce. Mm. So, I mean, th there is a better way, and it and it and it works. It, it, it works for a number of reasons, from my point of view. So, if you think about this continual assessment versus the traditional single point in time, I, I would say it works for a number of reasons, and I focus on those things rather than you know what what we do. I start with your employees actually like it. So when we poll employees and we poll employees and all new customers, nine out of 10 of them say, I prefer this to the old way. That's quite compelling. Um, also, management like it because it reduces the time lost to inefficient and sometimes completely unnecessary refresher training. And it reduces employee carping and it reduces the need for them to go around and boot employees up the arse metaphorically to do this month's refresher training so it's really popular with management it provides a quality of evidence that compliance and risk professionals love and have mm. been asking for for years um, and i think one of the secrets of its success in terms of why does it work where well, the artificial intelligence allows us to treat every one of your employees as an individual so rather than and bear in mind, your regulator is using technology like this, for want of a better word, against you. Yeah, Our artificial intelligence allows you to treat your employees as individuals, which is far more efficient, far more respectful, yeah, and far more powerful than your current approach of treating everyone the same, albeit everyone in the same job function the same. And I saw a data point that said that invest in my development was the number one reason in 2022 for employees to choose an employer mm. that's quite a stark that. quite a stark data point mm. Mm. Um, i think that gen x gen y gen z can't remember which one we're on now millennials or, you know are more forensic aren't they um in their critiquing of firms and their evaluation of 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 their training, their, their um, career-specific training and their learning um, than they've ever been before. So, yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Ab Absolutely. I mean, I, I could I could wax lyrical about how how, how Gen Z um, approach learning. You know, I've you know, I, 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 kids who just, they'll, they'll Google it. It's just, it's all about them. It's what they know. So not really interest anyone else. It's about them. Um, and I think that, Quite, quite candidly, workplace training is massively out of step on the whole with real life, mm. which is, let's face it, entirely personalised. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see. I'm, I'm interested to see, um, Adrian, um, your observations of how this this supports. And I don't want to put words in your mouth. The second line, you know, the compliance function and the risk function. How uh, this approach to continual assessments really supports them either you know supporting the first line but also managing upwards to, to yeah. the third line and to and providing mi to to the board uh, yeah sorry someone's, i think my window things are on right um so uh, the second line the question was wasn't it so um how's it sports go uh, the second line so a mi from crevanelli is um generally used by risk and compliance teams to um identify trends and threats provide helpful, actionable insights back into the business. We've got an automated reporting function, um, vital for management committees to understand what's happening on the ground with the first line. Um, and enabling to jump on to, the, the way I look at it is it, 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 
it's a lead indicator rather than a lag indicator. And a lot of the work, a lot of the data that second line have to work with is, is lag indicators. So it's already happened. We've already caused the problem. Yes, the, yeah, yeah, it's true. One of the beauties with, with, with Nelly is it, it, it provides lead indicators. So second line can act ideally before the problems occurred. Mm, mm, mm. And yeah, if we don't, can't forget or won't forget that the regulator is expecting outcomes um, and you know we used it in previous webinars that phrase you know um, show me don't tell me show me and you've listed a number of outcomes that clients of Nelly are experiencing right now yeah I mean there's that I mean there's some good shout outs there it really depends on what 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 is your business yeah and that AI can be uh, pointed at any number of outcomes, but in every instance, the AI relates to improving the competence of your people, individuals, yeah? So um, it's, it doesn't just do compliance. And I think you would be selling Nelly very short if you said it's a compliance tool. It's not, it is a tool that makes your people the best they can be in their role. And in, in my parlance, that is a, a hyper-competent employee, just like I get when I go into the Apple store. Mm. Mm. Okay, I like that. I like that. Um, love to take questions, love to take feedback, love to take your own understanding of what we've said here. We would also like to ask you to say, look, you know, if you, um, like to learn more about how elephants don't forget and the AI tool that um, we provide to leading brands and leading organizations in the financial services market um, to help you achieve this customer centric culture and other challenges. Um, please do um, fill in the poll that we have um, posted on the screen right now and there. Um, be very interested. Um, we've talked about a number of things here, um, Adrian. Regulators expecting customer better customer outcomes. Um, obviously, that doesn't come at the sacrifice of profits. I think we've slain that myth um, in this webinar there. But so. it's going to be hugely challenging for organisations. But there are also many opportunities I see um, in this to differentiate <laughs> yourself from the competition. You, you know, love this opportunities driven by consumer duty. No, no one else believes you. I know, I know, I know. I'm trying hard. <laughs> I'm not employed by the FCA, by the way. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think you know. Joking aside, I, I mean, there's. It, it's that old analogy. You look at glass half full, glass half empty. This is something I've got to do. Am I going to do it begrudgingly, or am I going to embrace it and 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 make the most of it? Genuinely, if you look at Apple, they've made just one of the biggest global businesses that's super profitable from taking that stance to say we're going to embrace this we're going to put the customer at the center of our universe mm. yeah you know what? i think it I, I think the sector's got the most enormous hill to climb and i don't for a second and you know, i'm not advocating put nelly and solve all your problems I, i'm acknowledging there's a huge amount of work to do and it's it's challenging. And I'm sort of calling out those firms that are thinking, yeah, we got this covered. We got this covered. Mm. I'm thinking that that's delusional, my general customer analogy. But um, I do think there's a huge amount of work to be done. And your regulator might, in a number of instances, have leapfrogged you in their use of technology. And they're using that technology against you. Mm. Uh, we've got a question in the chat talking about practical yeah. ideas. Um, to um, to support, I, I believe, a better culture within the organisation. Thank you very much for um, sharing that question. Um, I guess that um, implementing Clever Nelly <laughs> will, be one, will be one of those. Um, um, but outside of that, um, Adrian, where, where have you seen organisations that you're working with? You know, um, I would turn to um, you know, communication, um, transparency, um, certainly the brands that you refer to in terms of like Apple and other organizations, there, there seems to be a transparency between the first line, second line and third line. 
It's a good word, Philip, because I think without exception, every one of the brands we work with has decided to face the facts and not hide from them. Yeah. So they've that they, they they believe, rightly so, they would rather know the extent of the problem and manage it and fix it than not know. Mm. Um, and I think that's the, the you know. <laughs> let's face it there's a lot there's a lot of firms out there that suspect they've got a problem but no way of quantifying it and continue on their way so i think the first stage is every, every brand that's a commonality to every brand we trade with in every industry they made the decision they would rather see the extent of the problem um, than not and the first thing that nelly does is quantify the extent of the problem and in my parlance if it's not measurable it's not manageable. Yeah, um, and that stuff is that is that from the top? Is that driven by the middle um, and by compliance or by risk? That says you know we just want hey, to make sure. That's a good question, Philip. In, in 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 our most successful deployments, it's driven by a group of mm -hmm. people. Yeah, sometimes subject matter experts, sometimes product owners. Almost always compliance, L&D, exec. These are the deployments that work where already, I mean, you're seeing cultural cues when you've got a cross section of the organization involved in deploying this technology. Mm. 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 And I, and I think that we've got one minute, Philip. And you're still going. <laughs> yes, I don't want to ever you know, be on time for a webinar, let alone. And, um, and time for anything in my life. So why should I start now? Um, so <laughs> um, in terms of like wrapping up, we better come to a close because I know that people have got 12 o'clock hard stops um, there. Um, call to action, um, what should they do next? What they should, should they do differently? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how much of what we said was a massive surprise. Um, from my point of view, the, 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 the one action is, you know, you, you can decide which side of the fence you're on, whether you're gonna be uh, one of those that wants the answer or one of those who's going to stick the head in the sand assuming you're on the side of the fence that says I want uh, I, I want the answer you need to look at your current approach to employee training competence because it mm. doesn't work mm. okay and just a sidebar issue um, does um, um, Clevenelli work with Salesforce um... I assume that's the product Salesforce as opposed to sales forces yeah um, <laughs> so yes it does. we've got a lot of customers use Salesforce yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Look, um, thank you very much for your time, Adrian, and thank you for participating in this webinar. If you want to reach out to Adrian directly, um, you can message him. We'll actually provide you with um, his details afterwards. A PDF version of the slide deck will be made available by the end of the week. And if you want to pose any questions or any queries about anything that we've touched upon there, um, please do reach out to us there. Um, please have a look at the chat function there where we've downloaded some key documents from the FCA as well. And we've mapped how um, Clever Nelly can actually match, meet, and also exceed what the regulator is talking about, whether it's SMCR, conduct and culture expectations, as well as consumer duties. So please, if you want to reach out, then you can access our knowledge center, which is on, on our website there with lots of purple papers um, to feast on what Adrian has talked about there. Thank you very much indeed for your time and thank you very much um, for making this an interactive and engaging webinar. Thanks.